Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the AUD podcast channel. I'm your host Khaled Abu Jubain. We are honored to have Mr. Richard Fitzgerald as our guest on the show today. Richard is the CEO and founder of Augustus Media, an award-winning modern media company in the UAE and KSA. They are the publishers of Love in Dubai, Love in Saudi and Smashy TV. He has worked in the media advertising space for almost 20 years across agencies in Ireland, England and the UAE. In this episode you'll learn how technology is constantly changing media. Richard shares his advice for young students entering the field. The importance of curating your content for the relevant platforms and will AI replace marketing agencies. Please join me in welcoming to the show, Mr. Richard Fitzgerald. Thanks, Khaled. Thanks. First time being doing something AUD, so it's great to be here. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. So guys, for people who don't know, uh, this is uh, mine and Richard's second round <laughs> of a podcast. I had the pleasure of having him on my show uh, about a year ago. Um, and I really wanted to bring you on again, Richard, because I think since we last spoke, a lot has changed, um, especially with the, the introduction of AI and you know the shift to the growth of TikTok and YouTube and being a lot more video based seems to be the way things are moving now. So. When we last spoke, um, I know when you started your career, you saw digitization uh, back in 06. You're like, okay, that seems like something that's going to grow in the future. And look where we are now, and it is the industry standard. But I think now it'd be interesting to have another conversation to be like, all right, where are we, where is, you know, where's that next thing? Where are we going to go next? How are things going to change? And who better to have on the show than someone <laughs> who's been in it for over, you know, 20 years by now. But before we get into everything, Richard, why don't you give all of us a little bit of background about yourself and we'll take it from there. Uh, yeah, you're right that things have changed a lot. They constantly change. I think if we spoke two years ago, I guess we spoke a year ago. If we spoke two years ago, we'd be talking a lot about Web3. Yeah. But now <laughs> it's, it's a lot about automation and, and AI. Uh, yeah, my background is a simple enough story. I grew up in the southeast coast of Ireland. Uh, at 12, I went to boarding school. Uh, and then in in, Dub, near, in Calair near Dublin, and then uh, I loved football, and I wanted to be a coach. And my mum said I need to go to university, <laughs> so I did my coaching badges while I was in university, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I took I didn't get high points in the leaving cert they call it in Ireland. Neither did everyone in my class. It was kind of a rugby <laughs> school, and we all ended up in a university in Dublin. About half the seventy boys ended up in the university. Uh, and I, we all ended up doing an, a BA, a Bachelor of Arts. So I picked one language and one business subject and psychology, but I dropped psychology after a year. I thought I would do psychology because Arsene Wenger and uh, Jose Marino studied it in Strasbourg and I think Lisbon. And I thought that, oh, football coaches do psychology because they, <laughs> they can get through to players. And then I realized psychology was just learning off studies that other people did and there was mm -hmm. nothing creative about it. So I dropped it. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't hack it. And then so but I still had the language in the business. And, uh, you know, by the time that was ending about 2006, I had a year in Germany. I kind of realized that football coaching wasn't for me, mm -hmm. that uh, it was all about the coaches that I was working under weren't as inspiring as the ones on TV and in the books. Sure. So I sure. thought, oh, I can't do this for 30, 40 years. I get bored quite quickly. You know, the education that I was getting and, mm. you know, by picking a language, uh, German, and by picking a business subject, you really do have a broad, it's not the sort of learning how to speak. Like German was really about uh, the learning pop culture through uh, German liter literature and sure. movies through German uh, and, it, and it was very interesting that way so I, I think my and, and through the kind of Jesuit education I had I think my mind was broad uh, at that stage and for some reason I wanted to do advertising like the fusion of c commerce and creativity and um, I couldn't get a job in it. Mm. Uh, I didn't know how. So I started the usual, like, who knows who in the family sort of thing. And my auntie uh, was leading sort of uh, the equivalent, the National Health Board, a department there to, uh, and she spent a lot of money with the health board mm. on advertising. So I tried to work <laughs> with the agency, but it didn't work. So there was no nepot there was no favors. <laughs> Uh, and I ended up taking a job in outdoor advertising sales and then doing an evening course, like without much money, you know, like, tr like running from 
uh, like jogging ex exercise after work to the train station to mm -hmm. get into in inner city paying myself like 500 euro to do the only digital marketing course in Ireland in 2006 and coming top of that class. So I was kind of like, okay, I'm passionate about this. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was, I was selling outdoor, what they call six sheet advertising boards outside news agents. Yeah. Uh, where they put the newspapers in a box. There's an, Oh yeah. 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 Poster yeah. There. Mm -hmm. And we were, and that was my plan. It was next, it was my job. It was an Excel sheet job. It wasn't creative. It was matching up the sort of seven up and Coca-Cola uh, posters and campaigns. Or the, I remember there was a Transformers movie and I, and I took the, the big Optimus <laughs> Prime six sheet poster in my wall. It was the biggest poster I ever had. So like, uh, so that was advertising to me. But by doing the diploma, I then was able to impress in an interview with the biggest digital agency at the time in Dublin. Because you had the skill set now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and there, I had something new for them. And I was reading the sort of, the magazines, uh, the industry magazines were coming to the owner of the outdoor company and they were pawning up outside his office. So I would just sponge all that information and I would get the American lingo and the English lingo. And it was kind of like really cracking, trying to get in the door of uh, digital advertising. And like fast forward, that was sort of 2007, with an agency in Ireland. By 2010, I joined a social media agency in London. And by 2012, I joined the social media agency in Dubai. And then by 2015, I set up uh, Love in Dubai and Augustus Media. And um, I remember on our last um, recording, you said the reason you decided to launch Augustus is because you kept, um, if I remember correctly, you kept wanting to excel in your career, but you weren't getting where the places you were working weren't giving you the opportunities that you wanted or to fulfill the vision or the idea that you had about advertising and marketing. And you said something last time, um, and you said things don't, things don't get disrupted or they, might, they won't disappear, but they might become you know, out of date. So I wanna ask you now, in 2023, do you feel that the, digi the digital marketing we've been doing now or what's been become the common thing for the last 20 years is starting to feel outdated or what is your what are your thoughts given with the advancement you know of technology all these new different ways you can market now compared to how you could before so from my perspective it feels like it start that it's starting to shift to something that new something that we're not familiar with yet it's such a big question. I th think it depends on where you're coming from. If you think of fundamentals of business, then I think even legacy media companies are still doing good business. Like mm -hmm. if a TV company is run really well today, it can still do good business. And I think so fundamental business, uh, you don't need to change as fast as you think the world is changing sometimes. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I think so. That seems like, so counterintuitive to what you typically hear nowadays. Yeah, I mean, well, I think obviously we need to change and adapt or survive and all that. But I think, you know, it's more important to be run, run, have a product and have a market value and have a good way of executing it. Uh, there are massive changes and I, and I grapple and struggle with it all the time. But uh, I had a meeting with an investor recently. Not that I'm looking for investment, it's just someone approached us. And they said they write minimum 50 million checks. And they told me that uh, I said our companies were 20, 30 million dollars. Uh, and they were trying to say that like, well, what's the bigger idea? How do you, and I'm kind of like, this is a big idea. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, and it, and it can get bigger over time. But, uh, you know, they said that you need to, uh, you need to, well, they gave options. You can either grow organically, you can get debt, or you can, raise funding mm -hmm. for equity and with that funding you can accelerate a growth faster because much to the kind of point of your question is that technologies move really fast and unless you go after them when they're happening you won't get there and uh how i run this i definitely lean towards the opposite to that the mm. sort of incremental internal uh, pivoting when the point to pivot is right but looking at at what's in front of you like testing internally and i think you know i think you can do it at all levels but with media in particularly uh our the vision for augustus media is you know the, the vision is to kind of well beyond the mission is to kind of establish and maintain a new order in media and uh with that in mind we want to we always said we're building a, uh, a new media company, a modern media company, mm -hmm. and to be the preferred one in the region. And 
uh, that's like building a new law firm. So that's like, uh, you know, doing, doing things in media that were done before on new technologies. Mm. But it's still, very, it's still the principles and the fundamental. Like, uh, for example, we love to recruit from nice picture of AUD behind us. And there's the Hamad bin Rashid School for journalism here and for media. And that, that's, that's sort of, we're not necessary. we're not saying, we want to hire those people. And we want to have jobs and vocations on top of AI and mm. on top of mm. creators and on top of, like we still believe in the fundamentals of this stuff. Yeah. Still believe the fundamentals of marketing. And uh, so, so there's that as well. But look, every day, like we grapple with like, you know, why do we have love in Dubai when everyone's w engaging with influencers? Why do we have a website when no one's on websites? Why, do, why are we doing Instagram carousel posts when vertical video is the biggest thing now? Why are we, uh, you know, like yeah, the, yeah. The, the technology that powers Love in Dubai's website is nearly 20 years old. It's WordPress, it's 15, 20 years old. Um, yeah, and uh, so, so the, do, does that mean we need to change? Uh, I, I think it's a natural evolution. I think if you embrace technology, like we say digital, um, our own IP and this region are the three pillars uh, of what governs our decisions. So if we embrace digital, then, uh, then we will invest more in that than we would in, in events or in mm -hmm. bricks and mortar, like a love and shop or whatever. Um, and then if we embrace digital, uh, it still means like, you know, it still means embracing the current technologies. Like part of the answer to this question is, I do think that the, that these are the train tracks for the next, you know, uh, for the for the current, whatever you call it, in, in the fourth industrial revolution or, or the internet age. I, I still th think that a lot of the building blocks of the internet aren't going to be total disrupted. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if, you, if you believe in the narratives of sort of web one, web two, web three, and I kind of do, the web one companies are still the biggest market, cap, market capitalization, and the web two companies didn't pass them out. You know, Amazon and Google, which are 95, 97, and people debate the terminology, but like web 2.0 was Facebook and those social networks, and they didn't pass out the web one companies. Mm. And I, I don't see web three, especially now, but the crypto companies being <laughs> worth more than Facebook, right? Yeah. But like, so I, so to that point, I think the, I think that train tracks of like infrastructure of the, the internet sort of railroads. And then if you can kind of be the toll bridge on top of that, and mm -hmm. you can kind of work around that and, and collect that way, then I think you're well placed. Yeah, uh, I really like that analogy. Um, you talking about there are while technology is advancing while there are a lot of different opportunities now a lot of the things although the technologies might be advancing the the print the fundamental principles for example of marketing are still valid um, you still need to have a good strong infrastructure to be able to even make use or amplify yourself with these new technologies because if you don't have that in place then that might not that could be a detriment to your business whether rather than an advantage and it was really refreshing hearing you say that every day you know the examples you're using you know the carousel post or do we do a video or people are engaging now with influencers more than this and I, I can imagine it's when there's so much noise around you it can be hard to like just block it out and you have to take a step back and you know look at what do I believe whether rightly or wrongly this is my philosophy this is how I think we should move forward and I think that's really can be really challenging sometimes and one thing you mentioned for example um you uh hiring you know uh, recruiting students from here from the university and so on uh, of, as you know they have a great school here i wanted to ask you because this is something i was thinking about um and i'm really glad you brought up the point about students and future recruitment if i'm a young student now and i want to enter into this field of either media or journalism or advertising you know in that in that space what do you think are the skill sets or the mindset that I need to start developing from now so that in four years when I'm graduate, I've, I've moved in parallel with the times and you know where, where, and where we think the market is gonna be? Yeah, you know, I think the beauty is like what I've learned over time, it's like sports. You can have so many different mindsets and personalities uh, and even passion points and you can still fit in a team you can still play the sport so you actually don't need much 
tend to work, provided there's jobs in media, yeah. and there aren't that many jobs, unfortunately. Uh, but you don't need much, right? Like if there's a job there and you, you've got through university, you can pretty much sail through a career, right? And that doesn't mean you're going to feel great or you're going to be fulfilled or you're going to uh, reach a level that might be perceived as success by others. So, uh, but I think you're getting at like what would what would be the mindset needed to sort of deal with the changes and exactly yeah, yeah. and and sort of be successful. Um, you you can I mean every the advice always for people in their you know it's the Jack Ma quote of like learning your twenties, uh, uh, learning your twenties something else in your 30s and do <laughs> do what you know well or something yeah, in your 40s. In your 30s yeah, yeah, and, then, yeah. and then let others do it in your 50s something yeah. like that. but so i think it, there's that about your 20s is sort of learn what learn from others but uh you can then sort of try and see where the puck is going and you can kind of say uh like i, I fundamentally think and uh, you're kind of getting at it with technology i think that media has really changed and i mm. think that the a skill set needed is like uh, a curator right you can be an artist but I think the artists today in media are the influencers and I think the media companies are the curator are the people who put on the exhibition and who pick the best paintings for which wall and tell a story and I think that's that's I think there's a big change in journalism in that mm. I don't know if it's been, been taught in universities but I find what comes out of the universities is someone who knows how to write an article, how to research, and the ethics of journalism mm -hmm. and fact check. Uh, but I don't think they've learned how to do the discovery piece. And I don't I think see. they've learned how to do the distribution piece. And the discovery piece is no longer research in the traditional way. And it's no longer going and sitting to someone for hours and listening to the interview. It can be. In slow news, it can be. But in fast social news publishing, discovery is knowing how to search the he red heat map on Snapchat yeah. and knowing how to use the filters on Tweet TweetDeck or XPro and knowing how to go on to Instagram places and knowing how to curate everything and know how to know the difference of fake news and building that visual eye mm. of training yourself to deal with all the noise and to sift through it really fast. And it's a real skill set in discovery there. And then to know your audience and, and then the packaging is a lot to do with what's my media lens? What's the, uh, you know, like what's the purpose of the message that I'm trying to get across? And I think digital has fundamentally changed that. I think those skills will be super important with AI and when many of these things can be more assisted. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And on the, uh, and I think you touched on something really important is um, from a media landscape, let's say you're a young person, a young student getting into that field is to not, the discovery part is crucial. It is very important, but there's so many different ways now and probably more efficient ways to get that same level of research that you probably did before. So now another, the other two areas of distribution and, you know, the packaging of that are, and that's where it seems to be, that from my perspective, that's where everything seems to be shifting. And you touched on this last time. There's a difference between, you know, fast news and slow news. Um, before I get to my next question, could you just give us a brief uh, definition of what that means because I don't think many people have heard that term those two terms before yeah and they mightn't be the right term I think it's like media is to do with uh, form and function so form is design and function is utility or uh, media and medium so uh, medium is like the medium I'm receiving my news from so am I receiving my news from a platform or a TV or a radio that's the medium the the content in that platform is the media, right? And yeah. uh, that's the function. Like, what what is the media? And uh, you know, I just use fast and slow as a as a way of you know. We also say we do non scripted, but uh, fast social publishing today is always on. It's it, there's no deadline anymore. We we all know that. We're, there's no there's no like let's get the the magazine ready by six o'clock on a Friday. However because in fast news however if you're dropping a show if you're if you're dropping mm. this episode this is slow news this episode and if you're dropping an episode then you can design it and release it in that way yes so then you can like this is journalism so that's why i described it in that way you know journalists can do this and they can drop it in that way and they can uh, produce a 40 minute piece or etc right now a lot of these things will be cut up into 60 seconds sure. and be thrown into the fast news thing anyway but 
Um, but the, the slow thing is there. And I think um, there, there's a really good commentator, journalist on new media and, and youth trends in the US. Uh, and she just released a, bu- a book called Extremely Online uh, and Taylor Lawrence. And she, uh, they, were, they asked her, why a book? Like, you're extremely online, why a book? And, you know, kind of maybe a salesy answer, but she said that uh, there's a link, thing called link rot. And link rot means like if, if a journalist checks the articles they wrote in 2007, it's no longer there. Uh, mm. the, the article, the, the links have rotted or the website has changed and things like that. And the other thing is like, even in a 45 minute interview or a podcast or a long form or a, you know, a New York or a Vanity Fair 10,000 word article, uh, how deep can you go? Uh, and in, exactly. in, in a 7, 14, 20, 30 hour audio book or how many pages that is, you can go a lot deeper. So, uh, so I think from that point of view, these, the, the slow news thing can still be there and a the journalist can still do it. Uh, but but uh, you know, how someone might consume that book might be different as well to before. Yeah, um, and I, I think th- that example, comparing it to you know, the, the social media side, the social media content that we typically see nowadays as being you know, the fast news, can come from a slow news segment like something like we're like what we're doing right now that we can go a lot more in depth and but again one really important thing you said this last time we spoke as well is the packaging of that you know it's not just about oh i'm gonna cut up this clip and uh these two minutes and put it on instagram and it's gonna work there might be certain captions the way the lighting is done there's certain little tweaks that you need to be done to fit to that medium and from my perspective you said this last time, um, and you you're talking about how if you look at if you if you look at anything long term enough, then it's not a big deal. It will not seem today won't today won't seem like a big deal. It feels like this is just my perspective. Okay, I'm curious to hear what you think. It feels like where media has sh- is shifting now to a lot more fast news, shall we say, fast news formats, I, and you're getting continuously, you know bombarded with new information new news pieces and this all the time it's almost i feel like our ability to to be able to think long term is getting is decreasing because we're just getting so used to this you know attack of information on a consistent basis what would you say to that what are your thoughts yeah i think so i i kind of agree with you even in marketing like the branding and the, is a lot more tactical these days. Like mm. doing big content pieces uh, isn't as obvious anymore. Uh, and clients are, are booking reels and booking posts and working with influencers. And it's a lot more ephemeral. It's a lot more fast. It's a lot faster. Uh, but but you know to to the point. I think um, you know going back on what we were saying. Like I still think there's a role for long term planning. You know, it also depends how you run your business. It depends on what you're really True. talking about in content and everything. You know, one of the things that I was going to say is that um, the journalists, say on Love in Dubai, the, the journalists might think, oh, how do I get my news, right? And apart from people sending us videos on DMs and user-generated stuff, uh, you know, they'll think press releases. And they often, in our sort of reactive channel, uh, like our instant, our, our IM on, that we use, people send links from other news titles. And I always, I always question that. I always say, well, why, why? I think that's lazy. I think, you know, tr- seeing what's in the news is lazy. And I think, for example, if someone listens to this 45 minute chat or even tells AI to go look for something, <laughs> you know, but, 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 but that's, the, that's the new journalist. Like I was yeah. talking earlier about like Google, pl- uh, Instagram places and things like that. But there's so many of these podcast episodes how many articles are there about people who've said something on minute 36 in a podcast, right? Very few. Very few, until, unless the podcaster chooses that segment and puts it on Instagram, and then the international media say, X said this, mm. right? But, but the, the, the whole kind of point of like uh, having that journalistic eye of finding the story, I think... Uh, I think new media is a great source of that as well. Uh, but no, on, on the sort of uh, time of thinking, yeah, that's sort of discipline, isn't it? Right? It goes down to like we had World Mental Health Day this week, and yeah, yeah exactly. Like yeah. it's sort of like you know, there's lots of chat about how 
uh, people are sort of addicted to social media and we're, we are, as you mentioned, bombarded by noise and everything. But I think you need to get a grip of that. I think you yeah. need to sort of For have sure. self-discipline and you know, have, a, have a, a, a emotional intelligence and awareness enough that if it's getting too much, to find time to think and to take a break. <laughs> take a break. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't mean that you need to over plan everything like i'm a real believer in like having a, a sort of a north star know where you're going uh and we plan sort of year on year and okay. sort of quarter on quarter but we don't overly plan because if we overly planned things move like i could think of i could think of five business lines that i think could work like i think um you know, Lovin could be a streaming service with local news from the, like we do Love and Cairo show every day, Doha, we could, we could do that. And the buzz term in streaming for these channels is fast, free ad supported streaming service, right? And connected TV, CTV advertising is coming and all the legacy TV channels think they could do that. We can also do Love and Merch. We can have a merchandise, True. which yeah. we're, we're testing. We can have, uh, we can do a Love and Fest around National Day. Uh, we can build a concert event, right, that other media companies do. Uh, you know, a, a finance member of our team in Egypt told me that we should manage influencers. You know, we have Odium under Augustus, so we could do content studios under a smashy tv streaming service uh we could do documentaries about the inspiring people in the region so uh, and it goes on and on and on we yeah. can have uh, a software as a service with data analytics we can do we can do a SaaS thing on on we call it sensor when we have the apis for all our clients campaigns we mm -hmm. can build that out we can have augustus media academy because we have people from around the It'd region who want idea. to learn and we have lovely 12,000 square foot studios that you're in in Dubai Production City. So that uh, that's seven or eight business lines, <laughs> yeah. right? And that's on top of running a local newspaper yeah. in, tw in 20 cities, yeah. plus plus the, plus ha having the rights on for the s sports in UAE on Smashy TV. So like, you know, it, when sometimes when I hear of global companies and strategists and CEO talking about uh, initiating these things, I kind of go, yeah, it's cool because you've got like, 20, 30 years of funding and the legacy business. So you can choose to have many of these projects at once. But so I, I don't want to overly plan, but I don't want to kill those ideas either. You exactly. Know? Yeah. And so that's a great example of, you know, <laughs> every idea you just said, I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. And that could work and that could work. So I'm curious because I think uh, this is just a, a little bit of a tangent, but I think it would be useful for people to hear, you know, as an entrepreneur, you, you're when you're trying to build a business, you don't really, you get all these different ideas and you don't know which is going to work. Besides your core business, you start to think, okay, how can I maximize this? What other revenue streams could I add on top of, you know, our core business and what we're building? So in, for, uh, in those examples that you gave, do you have a methodology or a framework in your head that you can be like, okay, out of these eight, I think I'm going to, I'm going to, Maybe I'll try them all. Maybe I won't. Or, you know, how do you kind of segment it to kind of get to a place where you're like, all right, this is the new thing we're going to try. You know, you're not going to go crazy with it, but you're going to A-B test it, see if it works. And then you'll, you know, put your foot on the gas, you know, go with it. So how do you do that? Because even myself with my business and what I'm trying to do, I get all these different ideas, but I'm, I feel like, okay, I'm getting pulled in all these different directions and I don't know besides my core business and how much can I maximize from this, what other things can I do? And I don't really have a framework personally for that yet. I set the, I put the structure in place, structure, values, and uh, sort of methods in place that allows those things to happen naturally. Like okay, I mentioned, I mentioned the three sort of priorities for the business, yes. digital, Middle East, North Africa, and our own IP. So uh, we have a huge show in Saudi on Snapchat called Meme and Kessler Social Media. It's under the Smashy brand. So that show is important to me. The talent that built that show and moved on is important to me, but it's more important that we own that show. So, uh, so those, are, those are the first thing I mentioned that. Second thing is values. Velocity, ingenuity, and tenacity. From 15, 20 years working in the service type content business, I decided from seven different companies, from different leaders, from different markets, I decided that these values are needed to do well in this industry. Mm -hmm. Tenacity is about never giving up and about, you know, you don't get thanks today from the clients, you know, stop 
uh, looking for appreciation every second, right? You, you just have oh, to that's keep going. Some great words of advice. You, you have to keep going, right? Like, mm. uh, you know, and it also leads nicely into kind of the growth mindset versus fixed mindset. If I work on a pitch document and at eight o'clock at night, the PowerPoint crashes, don't go slam the laptop down and go my life and then walk home and cross and everything. No, like <laughs> if you're too tired, go home. But if, the, if you're not too tired and you, and you have energy uh, and, and you, you have the thing fresh, open it again and you'd be surprised what you can do in 30 minutes. And uh, so have that, that, that sort of tenacity, being mm. tenacious and consistent. Velocity is about momentum. Sure. And uh, we see it in sport, we see it in tennis, we see it in everything. You know, how can someone win six love one set and lose in the next? And that's on projects. So say I say those seven or eight ideas and there's more, uh, which one do I have the, am I going to insert enough mm. effort and resource mm -hmm. to generate momentum to get that done? And the third one is ingenuity. So uh, the, the brain has, is amazing. Uh, we now have 80 employees. They can, uh, they can come up with great things, let them. But, uh, you know, it's, it's within that, that structure and the structure is Augustus Media, preferred media in the region, and we have a business model. And mm -hmm. the business model are again three things. We have uh, our main business model is uh, advertising, but it's content advertising. So it's content that we make, uh, that we put on our channels, and we guarantee the views like an agency. Mm. And you need a certain type of skill set. You need client service people, you need marketers, right? Then we have uh, audience revenue. Audience revenue is, uh, we have no salespeople, we just have content uh, people. So the, if, if a, a podcast gets really, really big and you put it on the right ad tech platform, you will make money, right? Mm. Just through the audience revenue. Yeah. Uh, YouTube, if you get really big, you don't need to do one brand deal, you will make 50% share in that. The Snapchat show that we had made close to a million dollars over the last few years, it's dropped now wow. uh, on all our Snap shows. And we didn't sell an ad. Snapchat sales team sell the ad and give us 50% of the cut because they put it on the biggest show with the highest views, six billion top Snap views. Wow, right? so, that's awesome, man. So the, but that's, that's the strategy of the audience revenue. So when the fine, and then the third one is direct to consumer. That's the third bucket. It's about one, first one is 70% of a business. Second one is about 25, 30%. And the third one is less than 5%. And it's direct to consumer revenue. Uh, and you need a debit card or a credit card or maybe the token economy. And we can't get that at the moment with Love and We tried Love and Extra, we tried membership. Uh, we'll go back to it. I have some ideas of how the app, you know, how people can, uh, will subscribe to get extra in local news information on our app in the future. Sure. Uh, but at the moment, the subscription we're getting for is on streaming on Smashy TV. Uh, we stream basketball, futsal, volleyball, and handball in the UAE, the local leagues, and the local uh, people who play in those leagues, like the Emiratis, they subscribe 18 dirhams a month to watch this. It's a small amount. It makes five or 10,000 dirhams a month. doesn't co cover the cost of the streaming and the, and the cameras and everything, but uh, I want to continue to find ways to do that. And if you do that, then you know you need to service that category. Yeah. So I need a call center. I don't need a call center like uh, the telcos or the banks have. I need a digital empowered boss call center, right? So you start, you start looking at these three things and any of those seven ideas, I filter them through. Those three frameworks. All of that. All of that. And, and, okay. and, but, I do, but again, I don't shut it down. If someone has velocity, uh, momentum in one of the offices for one of these projects and a bit of their own idea and their own passion, off you go. You know, and that by that way, then you're not stuck to like, okay, Instagram and works in love in Dubai, but how does love in Karachi work? How does love in Beirut work? Yeah. Uh, you know, in Saudi, we do a lot more sort of shows and production because people aren't advertising on love in Riyadh and, and love in Saudi Arabia in the same way that they are in love in Dubai. But, but because we trust our people there, yeah. uh, all young Saudi media graduates, same thing, that we managed to build a business, you know? Yeah, and I guess, um, uh, I guess with the, that approach, uh, I really like how you have a very clear structure in place and you just filter it through those three, you know, three key areas, direct to consumer, you know, the branding stuff and so on. Um, and what I also like about what you said is you don't, even if it doesn't work now, you might not, it's not killing the idea, but it's prioritizing. Does it, 
where does it fit in these three? Is it like, let's say 60% on the branding side, but it's not really great, you know, maybe on the direct to consumer side. Okay, you can have a think about that, you can have a debate, but having that kind of structure in place, like this is really a great learning experience for me. Now I understand how you can go through that process. And, can, and so it's not like, you know, you're scratching your head all the time. No, it's very simple. These are our values. This is what we do. This is how we work. Does it hit one, two, or three? And to what level? And that will decide what's going to happen. But also that if someone else has an idea in, you know, the company or in a different office or someone, that fostering that creativity and that trust not only with your team and with your employees, because if they're working in that part of the world for that office, then they understand those cultural nuances. They understand because they're the consumers are. They're the consumers of that kind of content. So like they're going to start producing content that we know people like me are going to go and listen to. So when it comes to, uh, and you mentioned, and you said you have to be, today you need to be text, audio, and video, right? Now, uh, this is what I've seen in my experience the last three years with like podcasting. I've noticed if people told me, if you asked me three years ago, do you need video for a podcast? I'd be like, it's a nice to have, but the essence of a podcast is audio format. But today, to be honest, I would say for the best results or for your best chance at success, I would say you have to have video because, because everything has shifted, you know, with TikTok and YouTube shorts becoming so much more popular and reels and that fast and short kind of content, you're you're not going to be able to engage with your audience or with a, a wider audience to the level you could with a video of us, for example, talking right now, a small clip compared to if we put like an audiogram of, you know, the episode and so on. So my question to you is, should we now be, from my perspective, everything seems to be shifting to video. So is that where people content creators and people that are trying to get into the space or media companies and so on. Is that where we should be starting to put a, a more energy? What are, what are your thoughts about that? It depends. I mean, video is more expensive than audio to make, but uh, you know, there's many ways of answering that. I think uh, the word podcast, you use the word essence is audio. It sounds audio like mm -hmm. we, we you know, it's all about semantics, about naming and packaging of mediums, but like, it sounds like it's audio, but actually the biggest podcast shows in the world uh, are the new TV shows. And if you release a book in the UK or the US, you don't go on Oprah or the Jonathan Ross show anymore. No, you, yeah. You, you do the rounds on the big podcasts. podcast. Yeah. And that's what you try and do. And every, everyone knows that now. Mm -hmm. And the PRs know it and the industry knows it. And, you know, but, but like, the, yeah, you're right. Like about TikTok and, and the cuts and everything like that. And it goes back to the point I was saying earlier. It's more likely to be picked up by the media if they see it in the video. Exactly. Because they don't have time or they don't know that journalists aren't being taught to sift through that audio podcast and write a story about it. And then they can't embed the audiogram, you called it, because exactly. it's not a tweet. Exactly. So they can't have any supporting material. They can put quotes in. But they, and they can put a quote from the podcast, but then it's an article, and then you're still missing the, the video. <laughs> so, you know, I, like, I think it totally depends. Like, you know, and going back to the last thing I was saying about the structure and filtering decisions, that's because our business is structured in the way it is. Augustus Media Holdings with, you know, 20 cities at the moment under love and 13 channels on Smashy, Smashy Gaming. I have to, it's a lateral thinking and lateral spread company. Mm. It's like mm. a, it, it's, it's not clear cut. If, yeah. If we were doing one thing, if we were doing like a, a delivery app, you, you, you know, it's much easier to say no to other things because it's very clear what you're doing. Sure. Now, all of these companies pivot to everything anyway. So, yeah. But like, <laughs> but like, you know, so the reason I, I try not to pivot too much is because it's to help me with what you said you're struggling with, with all these things. So uh, that's why we do that. And it then goes to the audio video thing but for example the studios that you saw we you would think that we would do a lot of shows there we don't we hardly do any you know we still stick stick to the curating what other people are doing the instagram mm. carousel we're now moving more into finding a format that we can do vertical video but we're not going all in on it gotcha. because we're still sticking to the existing digital formats that we have yeah. a little bit and we don't pivot too much like we don't go all into one platform uh, so there's a bit of that and like 
um, you know, there are some modern media companies who raise a lot of money in other markets. And to justify that raising the money, they spent the money that they raised to making their own shows mm. and to do premium content. And they can't uh, generate the, enough revenue against that from YouTube, right? So uh, they then end up in trouble. And the, the Mr. Beasts, uh, and he's, he's a unique phenomenon. But yeah, like, he is. But many other YouTubers in this region do quite well on YouTube, but their co production costs are quite low. And they don't have massive studios and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but I do believe, like to that point, I do believe that uh, creators uh, who, who become media companies become media companies, as in they have these overheads. Creators who launch product lines then become a hybrid, like a, exactly, yeah. a Kylie Jenner hybrid or whatever, right? Sure. But they, you know, but and then they can kind of use the media as their marketing, use the podcast, and they don't need to monetize it. Yeah, like like Gary Vaynerchuk doesn't have ads on his YouTube because he's selling something else. He's selling a book, he's selling a speaker fee, or he has a service agency. So uh, and even like the original Bloomberg idea was to do media to sell the $20,000 a year Bloomberg like, portal. Report, yeah, so, yeah. so I think like you can, you can decide the other way around. Like you have to know what your business model is. Yeah. And if you know what your business model is, then you can kind of decide are you a media company and then you can decide are you a text audio or video one. Yeah. Like we decided we're a text audio video one because of the mobile phone and because we, we have a long-term view of media sure. in this region. And, uh, but if I was sort of, uh, trying if I had a different exit in mind or a different strategy in mind, I might just pick one. I might just pick audio. Like there's nothing wrong with uh, building an audio podcast app. There's nothing wrong with building a podcast network that's just audio. If True. that's what you want to do and you you can win in that market at that size, then great. Yeah, and I think you know that's I think that's a again a very good point that comes back to just. Because I think from my perspective, what I've been seeing but is one thing, but listening to you, it just broadens my mind and to everyone listening to think just about, it's kind of like picking your lane and what you want to do in that lane. You know, what resonates the most with you? What maybe is most cost effective for you? Where, where do you think you could have the biggest success? Is it text, audio, video? Is it all three? Like, for example, what you guys are doing and obviously with the mobile phone, you do probably have to be all that you do have to be encompassing those three layers. So we've talked about how media has changed. We talked about, we kind of have an idea a little bit about where it's going. Now I'm going to bring, you know, the million dollar question that everyone talks about AI. All right. Now I, ha I went to a workshop a couple of months ago by a guy called uh, Chris Doe. He, it was incredible. Um, and he said a quote that really stuck with me. He's like, if you're looking back over the last 20 years, when the internet came, it's like that was the new technological you know, revolution. And now here comes AI. And it's like, it's as if there's a chessboard and the chessboard now has been wiped clean. So all the guys that were winning for the last 20 years, now you have a bigger chance of succeeding compared to what you did maybe five to 10, year, five to 10 years ago against these you know, massive you know, corporations. And obviously, I, I use AI for, cer <clears throat> for certain things. It's incredibly time efficient, you know, when it comes to like making reels or stuff like that. It's very, very useful. Um, obviously, ChatGBT as well. It blows my mind how many different things you can do with it. But for example, when I'm preparing questions for a podcast, because I've, I've tested, I wanted to test myself. So I always do my own research. I've done it for over 100 episodes. You know, this is my process. But now I have ChatGBT, so I would be like, I'm having a recording with this person about this. Send me, uh, generate a list of questions. Sometimes there's there's a part of me that's like there's I'm like there's like an internal conflict going on because my goal in every recording is for someone to say at least once or like someone to be like to take a step back and be like that's a good question. That's all I want, and that's so satisfying for me <laughs> because I'm like I came up with that. But I've used ChatGBT. And it wasn't the same. Sometimes it would come up with questions. I'm like, okay, I would have never thought of that. So on the one hand, you can look at it and be like, okay, this could help broaden my creativity and like my thinking and open up different ways to think. The other side, I can think of it as being now, you know, this is going to make you lazier and so on. And when it comes to marketing, for example, now there are apps and tools that can generate for you entire 
visuals and campaigns and Adobe Firefly, like the, the opportunities are endless. So from your perspective, is, do you find it from your, do you see it as a hindrance to creativity and to, the, to marketing and so on? Or do you see it as another tool that can amplify your creativity? Yeah, to both. <laughs> right? Depending yeah. Depending on how you use it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's, a th I think that's how, like moving forward now, because I'll play devil's advocate, I'll be like, okay, why do people work with marketing agencies typically? Uh, for many different reasons. They want to run their ads or create social media posts for them, overall strategies, and so on. So I could play devil's advocate right now and be like, okay, now have an AI, let's say if it's social media content that can design and create all the different things and I can have AIs that can get me all the hashtags and stuff. So let me play devil's advocate and be like, okay, so what? You don't need the agency anymore. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Look, I think... Do you know I mean, what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> you know what I'm I, but I think, like, for example, uh, you know, for ex this year, usually we're really tight on software procurement and budgets because there's so many software services out there and everyone could just get the credit card and go wild and... HR software, legal software, all this sort of stuff. And even like over the years, uh, I, I remember I sent them, the team, a mid-journey subscription. <laughs> I, I forget how much it was. And they all got so excited. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, why are you excited? And they go, because we can do pictures of Elon Musk and, and uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg in Rome. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> cool, but other people do that too. Uh, why are you excited? And then, and then they said, Cause, cause it's, and they couldn't give it a use case. Like a direct, like good answer. And you know what's funny is that the price we were paying was three times more than what we would pay for Shutterstock or, or images, right? But we just feel we're excited. Now, I've let everyone use all sorts of AI. Uh, like for the captions on the vertical videos, uh, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new one this week, Capital with an OL.AI which writes an article. And to test it, there's two big buzzwords in Dubai right now, that things that get traffic all over Dubai. One is the price of rent, and the other <laughs> one is the traffic, right? So I, I went into capital.ai and I said, write an article. This isn't a chat GPT. This is better, really, really good. Write an article about uh, the rent prices and what's affecting it. And it gave, gave me back like its own proprietary graphs and graphics that wasn't taken from Bloomberg and a whole essay, right? And then I was like, okay, cool. You don't need the agency. You don't need the writer. You put that on the website. But that's not what this is going to be used for. Because as soon as articles can be done that way, then they're no longer what they were in terms of, I can't really articulate this, but I don't think the article will serve the purpose anymore. So I don't think this software, this software sounds like a great idea because mm. you can write lots of articles. Yeah. But why do you need lots of articles anymore? You know, if, 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 if someone builds an app that gives you that information, and I, like I'm in media, so I'm going like, well, obviously I need the graphics, right? And, and I do think that you do need the app, and I, I, I do think, but maybe there's a point that, uh, you know, the thing that we think it's going to replace, because the fact that it's so easy to do, then that thing doesn't have the value anymore. Exactly. You know, so it's exactly. kind of like, like, okay, sure, that's going to replace those jobs. Yeah, but not everyone wants to read the article now because mm -hmm. I can get it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, so yeah. There's a lot of, there's other things like that. It's like, oh, the AI for this, cool. But that thing might be needed now. Like, and, and then well, because AI moves something somewhere else. And we saw this with technology does this, Yeah. right? Like if you go, you know, if you're like, I've got something that can do digital photography, right? I've got the, I've got an AI version of a camera. Yeah, but I have a phone or whatever, you know, that, that type of language and things like that. But to your point about, you know, I was doing a, a panel yesterday at the Future Innovation Summit and I have a confession, like I, I should have said that on the panel, but <laughs> the panel wasn't about, I went to the Dubai uh, Museum of the Future after. Oh, and sorry. the headline of that was, uh, it's on again today, it was the Dubai Assembly uh, for Generative AI. So the point of the whole event was generative AI. But uh, so it's different to the panel that I had at the Future Innovation Summit, mm -hmm. which was about technologies on every type of AI. So w there was no one on the panel from Gen AI content. There was one person who was uh, real estate, one person from telco, one person from uh, medical, one person from something else and something else. 
And uh, so we didn't actually talk about content. We talked about drones uh, surveying landscape to help mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. decisions on data and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I found interesting. Yeah. And then I was thinking like, well, uh, you know, drones we thought were just for photos, like this, this here, my, this photo of the, of the overview of the AUD might have been taken by a helicopter in the past, now can be taken by a drone, but actually it could help with the excavation and everything like that. Then, then, what, then if you're building a drone, then you have different customers now. Exactly, right? different use cases, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you, you, you're in those five sectors I talked about, AI can be a business. So in medical, it can be a business, and it's not generative AI. But going to the generative AI piece, uh, the, the assembly uh, in, in the Museum of the Future was excellent. And I attended four back-to-back 15-minute -back talks. And the first three were from SAP, IBM, and McKinsey. And okay. the fourth one was from a new AI company called uh, Huggy Face. Hug, Hug Face. The, and I, that's the emoji with the uh, cheeks and the hands out. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But what I thought was fascinating, a few takeouts from that is uh, Huggy Face, I hope it was right, uh, a yellow colorful looking brand. They will go, they're, they've just done their fourth round of investments, wow. like Series D with Google and Amazon who are already clients. So they will go public and they'll be billions, right? But they're not actually a consumer product. They're in the background. Like, mm. like CrowdStrike is a, a cybersecurity billion dollar listed company that most consumers don't know what it is, but every business knows what it is. Data, dog, end, yeah. data dog sounds like cool, like yeah. a data dog bouncing <laughs> yeah. around, but actually it powers like Angami and all these apps, right? Because it's an app data thing, but no one, you and I don't have a subscription for data dog sure. because there isn't one for us because yeah. we don't have you know, a multi-billion dollar app, yes, but anyway, so, but like, you know, joking, but so I think that that was one thing is that like, and well done to Dubai for having that guy talk, but uh, so that's one thing is that the huggy face thing is going to be really big and that's a B2B play. And what SAP, IBM and McKinsey, uh, I found it quite hilarious because they showed us their consultancy slides and they talked about all this opportunity and you know what they're selling to their clients. Mm -hmm their ability to talk about this stuff and they're charging for it. So that's two examples of people making money out of AI. And you and I talk about generative AI and obviously there's people making money out of generative AI now. There's influencers in Asia who aren't people who are making money for posts. Sure. There's uh, people who are doing content a lot faster than before. Uh, you know, editing reels faster and cashing in on that. So, so, so there's many ways of this stuff. And th that's all I think that it is. Like, I think it's uh, just an extension of what we're already doing. Yeah. And it will just amplify <clears throat> it faster. Uh, and uh, I think a key thing is you have to embrace it. And I love yeah. that you started that question by saying that you went to a workshop because that's embracing it. Mm. And you know, people might be listening to this and have FOMO and go, why didn't Khaled tell me about where that workshop <laughs> was? And who's that guy's name? I need to take that note. Yeah, yeah. But the, the beauty of learning and having an open mind, and we're in a university, so it's perfect for it, but like <laughs> having an open mind and embracing knowledge and learning, there's so much joys in learning. And if you have that after you graduate, and if you have that in your vocation, you don't, the FOMO goes away because it becomes about the learning. Yeah. And you can, like, now's an amazing time to learn about AI. Yeah. <laughs> no, and um, <clears throat> I couldn't have said, you know, couldn't have said it any, any better myself, Richard. Um, and I really like something that you, first of all, talking about AI, how it's an extension of ourselves. Will it replace some things? It will, but that will birth new things just like technology always does. It make it takes the, you know, it, if things are automation based, it is very, it's going to be very, very useful because it frees up more time for you to maybe think about doing something new that you would have never thought of doing before when you didn't have this time. And also when you were talking about the articles, it's funny because I was I, like, sometimes I play around with ChatGPT just to see what it would give me. And I'd be like, oh, rewrite my like bio. Okay, and it would come out with like a corporate level bio. I'm like, damn, that sounds, I would never write that. I can't write that. <laughs> sounds great. But then, but what's funny is already, even though it's very new, you can already, if you read something now, you can already start to get an idea. I'm like, it seems AI written. You know, there's, there's a human touch or that human element, that ingenuity, that way, the way we think, the way we write, the way we create content, that that will never disappear. 
But these things do make us, unfortunately, we, we do like things easier. We just do. We're just people. That's how it works. But I really like how you framed it in that way. And I think so many things take away from our conversation today about how technology, yes, technology advances and we should em embrace it correctly, you know, as you said, but also doesn't mean you have to throw out everything that you're doing and, you know, just jump headfirst into this. There are ways to incrementally in improve it, to, you know, build it out and to test in ways that are cost effective, that aren't going to damage your business. If you're a content creator, now there's, it's just a world of opportunity right now. Um, it's very exciting um, because every day I learn about a new AI, I'm like, oh, maybe I could do Maybe I could do that. I've never thought about, let's say, making clothes. Oh, but now this thing can make the design for me and then this can ship it to that. And th so there's just ideas and options. I'll give you an example of that, right? So I'm quite busy with doing what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Uh, but I like to listen to audio books. I like to learn. And sometimes I listen to, you know, investment books and about managing finances and things like that. And I listen to one by Benjamin Graham called Intelligent Investor that Warren Buffett follows. And uh, they have a sort of a formula of what's picking a good stock to do with, uh, you know, debt to equity ratio, uh, P price to earnings ratios. And they have about seven or eight criteria. And uh, I tried to, I went on the local boards as like the ADX and DFM and Tadawal and, um, you know, and I tried to pick stocks using that. And it took me a lot of time. I don't know if I was doing it right because I, I didn't train myself as a trader and I didn't train myself as a stock picker. And I, I felt from what I was data I was looking at, I felt that they were all missing one. In the, in the UAE stock exchange at the moment, they were all missing one of the seven. Yeah. Mm. And mainly it was to do with the price earnings ratio. So they were overvalued. So I didn't follow. And then I was having lunch yesterday and after maybe all this AI chat, I was kind of like, Oh, what if I just ask a, a stock uh, AI to give me market picks that fit these criteria, you know? So because the Warren Buffett analogy in investing is if you find one good one, go all in. Like why, if you, if you, uh, he spent 20, 30 years with no phone, no mobile, reading through these books, right? Yeah. And so it's not as simple as that, but like, and one level it is. Yeah, right? yeah. You know? So because I didn't have this data and I couldn't really pick it, I just bought five or six stocks I thought were okay that had high dividend yields. But actually now I'm going to go back and, I'm going to, and I Googled and there are already two apps that sound like this and I'm going to, I'm going to test that out. Exactly. You know? And because uh, I, I have more time and passion for doing this, podcasting yeah. and figuring out media than I do for investing. But there's things that you can automate. And I think for those things, it's quite cool. Exactly. And uh, I love what you said there that now you, that you weren't tra uh, trained as a stock picker or a trader or so on, but you do have some, you know, you, I know you're passionate about this, you know, this area and you've been reading, you always read the Financial Times. I remember you mentioned that to me uh, last time. And, but now you have something that like this AI is now helping you learn. How do I, why did it pick that stock? And then you can test it over time. Was it right? Was it wrong? Was my pick right? And having the ability to test it out in those different ways is how, you know, we learn. And just to round off our conversation for today, Richard, um, this is a question we ask all our guests. So as I mentioned before we started, the aim of this podcast is to show success comes in many forms and that key, uh, and the key point is that learning never stops. And I think a big summary of what we've talked about today is learning and the passion to learn. And if you're, if you're someone who's excited about learning, you, it will always serve you, you know, for the better. Now, I know this, every time I ask this question, everyone has probably 20 million learnings that they would like to share with me. But if you reflect back for yourself, if there's one game changer learning that you had that really just broke that ceiling, gave you a brand new perspective on life, on work, whatever the case might be, what would you say? Uh, yeah, it's going to be cheesy, but I think yeah, that's, which is fine. <laughs> no, but I, I think it's kind of what you were saying. I think there's that learning thing and linking it to the compounding, like the investment points, uh, investment compounds. Uh, so does fitness, right? Yeah. Like in, in the gym, uh, the, in the group that I work with, uh, they have that quote of one percent better every day. And I think I think the fitness compounds, like relationships compounds, and then uh, learning compounds and 
going back to that long-term view of the business, I can, in stressful moments, I can stay calm because of a long-term view. And also, like the point of this podcast is that success comes in many ways. Yeah, sure, like I just turned down a $12 million offer for the business. Uh, I have way more assets and money than I ever had before. Uh, but I feel that tr true success is the fact that I figured out that uh, I like learning. And when I was in university, I didn't... I liked being in university, but I didn't really embrace learning in in the way at the time. Yeah, I remember I was in I was in an Erasmus year in Germany, and I had a Spanish girlfriend, and we were watching shows, and uh, we were watching them in English, and I I was just being lazy and watching TV shows, and I was amazed that she, she was learning German and she wanted to learn English as well because she'd embraced learning then. Exactly, and now. When I go home in the evening, even though my brain is fried, I don't watch English shows. I watch Arabic shows. And no way, respect. All, respect. all the time, right? And That's awesome. But, I don't, but it doesn't, it's not like, oh, I need to learn Arabic. It's kind of, I enjoy it. And I know yeah. the added benefit of learning Arabic. So, and, and like, I don't know when that happens. And I, I know you were kind of looking for a point, but somewhere between like 21 and 40, but I think maybe like, in, in that time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I love that example that you just gave. I would have never, you know, guessed that. And I, from the all the Arab community, we support you. And any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, Richard, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. Uh, round one was great. Round two was even better. Um, I really, in both conversations we've had, I've learned so much from you. I think you have a very particular mindset and a keen eye into understanding not only the region but how media is changing and so on and for someone like me who's in media I guess as a podcaster it's always very refreshing to learn from you and for any students that are coming up they guys you must listen to this conversation to get yourself ready for the next few years and apply for jobs at Augustus and apply media, for please. jobs at Augustus or media internships guys. or anything yeah please um, do. and yeah I just wanted to say Richard again it's been a pleasure and thank you so much man and people want to reach out to you get in touch with you where can we find you? Yeah, anywhere. Like Google <laughs> me, Google Love in Dubai. Uh, I'm on everything. So yeah. yeah anyway. Perfect. Richard, thank you so much, man. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Khaled. Thanks. Cheers. Round two. <laughs> Round two indeed. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the AUD Podcast channel. We really hope that you enjoyed it and learned something from it. We have a lot of incredible guests lined up for you on the show, and we're so excited to bring you their inspiring stories. To stay up to date with all the latest episode releases, please make sure to like, share, follow, and subscribe to the podcast on the AUD Instagram page at AUD Dubai.